thank thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to, to speak to you all. And um, please feel free to jump in with questions as we go, um, and, and I'll sort of uh, go through and, and and stop at a couple points too. So um, thanks again for for the chance to speak and um, to give a little bit of additional background. Um, my research group really focuses on on two areas. Uh, one, which I won't focus on as much today, is the idea of precision phenotyping and really how do we identi better identify uh, subpopulations of patients within um, complex conditions to uh, help with biomarker association. Um, so take something like epilepsy. Um, why are we including people who have uh, seizures due to um, a car crash with a traumatic brain injury to um, kids who have had seizures since day zero um, with uh, a monogenic disorder? Um, and so uh, how do we sort of really pull all those out? And this, this is sort of a, an obvious example, but but they, they become harder and harder as you sort of get, get more granular. The second um, area is really around the deployment and measurement of AI in the clinic. Um, and so I think that's what a lot of the talk today will focus. It sort of uh, does blend between the two. Um, but, but this is really an area where um, it, it in part drew me to University of Chicago, I think. Uh, Columbia is actually a, a, a nice place to be giving this talk because unlike many of the places where this research comes out of, uh, these are more diverse health systems. And so one of the problems at Chicago was actually that uh, we couldn't use any of ethics models. We had to take models out of deployment uh, because they weren't working in our patient population. And so um, this has been something that uh, really drew me to, to, to coming to University of Chicago um, and starting my group here. And so to start out, I think this won't be news to sort of anybody on, on this call likely, but uh, rural data are, are challenging and, and we should sort of start out by acknowledging that they're a mess um, and, and sort of start from there. And then uh, you sort of already head off a lot of reviewers comments about sort of then uh, trying to deal with them. So if you sort of come from that perspective, um, you can uh, arrange your analyses in ways that you can still learn interesting things. And so um, an example of this challenge is if we look at um, a an example, so uh, type 2 diabetes, and look at the uh, eMERGE type 2 di diabetes phenotype uh, definitions. Um, and, and so this is a, a group that uh, I think is, is fairly well known, has been uh, cited many, many times. So a lot of people sort of rely on their, their phenotype definitions. They have this challenge that to define a control population, you, you are striking a balance between finding the group that definitely don't have the disease and trying to get a representative sample. And so that's a really hard uh, balance to, to actually strike. And so this is not meant to be a critique of what Emerge is doing, but rather to point out um, the, the challenging problem that they're sort of taking on in, in defining these, these controls. And so we did a, just a simple example, which I won't spend much time on um, because I want to, it's, it's not sort of the, the main point of, of today's talk, but in this example, uh, what we showed is if you, require a, a glucose test um, for the control population in, in type 2 diabetes, what you essentially end up with is a very different population than if you don't. And this is especially challenging if you think about, um, say, healthy individuals in their 20s. Um, oftentimes, because there's no suspicion of type 2 diabetes, there's no obesity, there's no other sort of uh, underlying condition that requires a glucose, te glucose test, they're never going to be allowed to be included in the control population. And so you, you can end up with vastly different groups. And these are just showing the, the age histograms to show that difference. Um, the important thing is if you then look at different associations, and sorry, um, this, this, for example, is looking at an association to, to depression. And again, uh, it's not particularly uh, critical for the rest of the talk other than to show, um, given these different definitions, you can end up with vastly different uh, odds ratios and, and significance um, depending on what would I would argue are, are simple or are, are sort of fairly reasonable um, differences in cohort definitions. So another example of this is if um, we are looking at epilepsy and um, we wanted to follow new onset epilepsy using structured EMR data. Um, and so in this example, uh, what we saw was that a uh, kid was diagnosed with generalized epilepsy, was then given this particular medication, uh, oxcarbazepine. Um, and then diagnosed again with generalized epilepsy. This pattern sort of continues. Uh, this may be what you'd expect for a, a chronic condition or something that's, that's gonna stick, on, stick around. Um, the challenge here is that um, ascorbazepine or, or, or the sort of the brand name here is uh, only for monotherapy and partial or for focal epilepsy. Um, it's not meant for generalized epilepsy. Um, and so what we're seeing here is that the ICD code doesn't align uh, with the actual treatment being given. 
Um, in fact, uh, it, it might not be as strong to say that it's contraindicated, but if you asked any sort of pediatric neurologist, they would essentially never give it because of this risk of actually making generalized seizures worse. Um, and so we had been doing this analysis using uh, things like claims data or, or other sort of structured data for the, for the analysis and ran into this problem. And um, then we said, okay, so how many patients is this occurring in? And in a, a patient population um, of about 20,000, we have this in about 100 patients. Um, so it's, it's not a sort of insignificant uh, amount of, of patients. And, and what you actually see is if you look at the notes, um, they were being diagnosed with partial epilepsy. Um, but there's no incentive to go back and, and change these ICD codes um, because uh, ascorbazepine is relatively cheap. There's no payer telling them that they need to correct the ICD code. There's no sort of a forcing mechanism for the back office billing to correct something where on the, on the clinical side, they have the note sort of indicating that it's focal epilepsy and it's not affecting treatment. And so um, given that we sort of, if we just look at the structured data, we end up with something like this, where we, we think that uh, these, these neurologists are doing a really bad job of treating these patients when in fact, that's, that's not the case. And so um, this sort of, again, continues on to this idea that these healthcare dynamics are, are really important in understanding what are the driving mechanisms to data generation for everything downstream? And so um, this was a, a paper that came out of uh, my postdoc lab um, right before I joined his lab, actually. But this was, I, I think, one of the, the better illustrations of this, where they looked at white blood cell count measures and compared that uh, to three-year survival and, and sort of asked the question of, if you take a uh, white blood cell count, um, does the time of day matter in comparison to whether the, the, the lab is uh, abnormal? And what they found was that uh, patients who had um, white blood cell counts between uh, midnight and 8 a.m. actually had lower three-year survival than patients who had abnormal white blood cell counts in general. Um, and so what we're starting to see is that if you're going to um, wake a patient up in the middle of the night or, or to do a blood draw, um, you're concerned about that patient. And so um, you're starting to, to see some of this clinical thinking making its way into the, the data that are actually being generated. Um, this sort of uh, naturally goes to, to sort of say, uh, if we look at the majority of labs and try to predict, <laughs> if, if we try to predict prior to a visit, whether somebody will have a, a lab during that visit or not, um, this again, not looking at sort of individual labs, this is a, a set of 240, uh, I think it's 241 actually, the vast majority of labs have a, a decent amount of signal of whether you'll actually be able to predict whether they'll be present in that, that next appointment or not. Um, it's obviously not perfect and it's not all of them, but it's really to indicate that um, we're, we're not typically working with data that are missing completely at random um, and instead have to sort of deal with uh, more strategic ways to sort of impute or, or to um, understand the, the data generation mechanism. And so this really all led up to a, a paper that came out in, in 2019 um, in, in MPJ Digital Medicine, that was a cooperation between UCSF, University of Chicago, and Google, um, where they predicted a, a variety of the outcomes that we, we see as the most common, um, things like in-hospital mortality and 30-day readmission, et cetera. Um, and, and so in this work, um, one of the, the big things was that they were using almost 47 billion total data points. And so this is the, the era of uh, now we truly have big data, how are you learning from it? Um, but, but our question was really, what are these models learning and can they be useful for individualized clinical decision-making? Uh, because we had some suspicions that they, they might be learning from things like uh, clinical behavior as opposed to um, things that, that, that are actually useful for uh, individual clinical decision-making. And so to do this, uh, we separated out data into a couple of categories. And I wanna first acknowledge that these are not um, We'll present them as if they're black and white for now, um, but but acknowledge that there really uh, are a lot of gray areas and, and there probably aren't just two categories, but this is, I think, a, a helpful way of thinking about it, where um, on one side, we have data that are uh, clinician initiated or say CI, um, and these are the data that are, are the result of a clinician making a conscious decision. And so these would be the things that are um, not done for every patient on a floor. Um, they're not sort of uh, routine data or, um, simple things that are uh, a diagnosis being put down or something like that. Um, they're, the, they're, they're sort of the, the I mean, they, they are the, the conscious uh, consciously decided thing. Somebody is actively taking a, um, a point to, to sort of put this data in. 
The other are NCI data, which which we would say are more of the actual patient state or routine data. Uh, like and, the... and these are data that are um, either uh, collected for everybody or or true measures of patient state, things like labs, et cetera. And so sort of the, the confusing example is, is the idea of like presence of a lab test. Um, it can be clinician initiated if if uh, it's not given to everybody and, and somebody wants a particular lab test, but it's not always because uh, oftentimes uh, everybody who uh, is on a certain floor might be having, um, say, vital signs being measured or um, get, get a particular lab test in this example. And so what we did with this is we wanted to ask what we can learn from CI data. And so we, we tried to uh, just focus in on um, a set of data that are unlikely to have uh, any of the, the NCI um, data. And so um, in this case, we, we used charges data. And, and this is something that I really wasn't familiar with prior to this project even. And so I, th I think it's sort of rarely used. But these are the data that are sort of behind the scenes that end up generating the, the bill that goes to the payer. Um, and sort of the, the, the justification for, for costs and, and, and what was used. And so you'll see here, there's a, there's a lot of supplies, there's medications. Um, one of the ones that I think is sort of interesting is you can see things like room and board. Um, you could also, uh, one that could be especially informative is you can see how long an operating room was actually reserved for um, and things like that can, can be uh, really informative about how, how a surgery actually went. Um, but the point here is these are only charges data. These are only things that are being done to, to care for a patient. There's no um, actual lab values or anything like that. And so um, we tried to, to predict a number of the same tasks using those charges data um, and, and want to acknowledge that we, uh, in some cases, intentionally handicapped our models and others, it was just due to, to the data that we were using. Um, and so in this, we, we only showed the comparison to the higher performing hospital. Um, we had uh, almost a thousand hospitals in our, our data set. So there are a lot of institutional effects, effects or, or batch effects that, that could be present. We can only compare to the higher performing hospital reported in the, the sort of original paper um, because uh, they didn't include sort of the exact counts in each of the um, hospitals. So, so it couldn't come up with an average. Um, additionally, uh, the baseline method, and this is probably the most important, um, includes 24 hours of data. Our data were de-identified and, and, and limited to the, the sort of day level. And so if, if a patient's uh, coming into the hospital at 10 p.m., we'd only have two hours of data for that patient. Um, and so I think that's a really important uh, limitation present in sort of uh, these data. Additionally, um, somewhat intentionally, we really limited our, our, our compute in our case. So the baseline model, um, they uh, had sort of the power of Google behind them and, and had 200,000 uh, compute hours to, to train their model. We, we intentionally kept ours to be less than 24 hours um, on very limited GPUs. Um, and then finally, you, this shouldn't be surprising given the types of data and what's available, we had far uh, less data per patient. And so when we did this, what we found was that uh, these, these operations data uh, bring you closer to performance to the original uh, baseline uh, than, than expected. So the blue here is the original paper. Um, just to remind you, it's the higher performing hospital. I think the um, second hospital was, was about 0.92. And so it, it sort of even brings it closer. Um, and then we could see sort of predictions at different points in time and showing uh, sort of the benefit of uh, having more than demographics. Um, unsurprisingly, age is a huge factor, um, but then there's there's some additional information available at admission and then the, the first day of charges. Um, and so this really led us to this idea that um, it, it's sort of surprising how well you could do with, with just charges data um, from the first day. And because of the data that we are using, you could actually uh, assemble uh, specific cohorts that, that you actually can do better. Um, and, and so an example of this was myocardi myocardial infarction, which we chose because it's certainly something that you can detect very, very early on um, upon a, a patient being seen by, by a clinician. And so you could then sort of place this patient in this cohort and, and, and run the model for them. Um, so it's, it's just to show uh, some of the potential of, of these uh, large, uh, less granular data. And so the real point of this all um, was to say, uh, I think that we should be really cautious when we are using data that are trained on uh, particularly uh, clinician initiated data. Um, because what we're essentially doing here is we're looking over the clinician's shoulder and, and sort of uh, cheating off of them and seeing, uh, are they worried about this patient or not? Um, and so the example that, that I sort of like to draw is, is the uh, third, third year med student um, just starting uh, their clinical rotations. and. 
um, they can see when the attending starts to get worried about a particular patient and know that that patient maybe has a bad prognosis from that as opposed to actually uh, knowing enough about the patient yet. And so it's sort of that that step of uh, where I think a lot of models are, are sitting at now and then they're able to learn from the expert as opposed to being the expert themselves yet. And so beyond that, I think these models can actually cause harm if we uh, sort of rush into deploying them. And, and I'll give an example of how I think this can be through what we're calling a confusing feedback cycle. So an example of this is if you have a patient who comes in and, and a physician's considering uh, a possible pulmonary embolism and because of this, they perform a series of actions and order um, a CTPA, a CT pulmonary angiogram, um, which is what you would uh, order to, to look and see if you actually see a pulmonary embolism. And based off of that, uh, you don't see a pulmonary embolism, and, and therefore you think that the patient is, is lower risk. They don't have a, a PE, so um, you are, uh, in your head, reducing the risk and, and a little bit less worried about that patient. But then you go back to the EMR, and, and you're seeing... Um, Going back to this model that doesn't actually read the CT image, it's just trained on um, everything that you've been doing. So all of the, the CI data, um, it will continue to tell you that the patient is high risk until you start to take other actions. But because you haven't done anything other than look at the CT yet, and the last thing the model saw was that you ordered the CT, um, you're going to be confused because you, the, the EMR is still going to be sort of flashing red saying this patient's high risk. Um, and you don't really know exactly what it's basing that, that determination off of. And so we could we could accidentally create these confusing feedback cycles for physicians based off of this. And, and I'll give a, an example of uh, what I think is one of those uh, in, in, in a little bit. But in general, I just want to make the point that I think that these models can be useful, but they should be used in, in population-based applications, things like uh, dashboards or um, something to uh, aggregate total risk for uh, an inpatient floor or ward or something like that, where maybe it's helping you to do things like uh, supply chain uh, planning or uh, nurse staffing or, or other things like that that are at the population level as opposed to um, what you should do next for that, that individual patient. We've done um, some further work in this area. Um, a student of mine um, who is now uh, just started a, a PhD at Carnegie Mellon um, is uh, where we look at different models trained on different data and sort of treat these as if they are uh, different agents within the system. So we have a, a sort of clinician initiated model that is just working off of uh, clinician behavior. We have a uh, NCI model or non-clinician initiated model, which we're saying is, is a better proxy for uh, patient physiology. And then like most models that are, are actually deployed, we have sort of this, this full featured model. And when these models diverge, that's when we think things are really interesting. So when these models come up with different risk scores, so again, to go back to this example of uh, pulmonary embolism, um, if you ordered that CT and then you don't take any actions after the fact indicating that um, there is a PE, so you're doing things that, that make it seem like there's no PE, um, then you might have a CI model that is predicting low risk based off the clinician's actions. So, so you ordered the PE, then you start sort of going to figure out what else could be wrong because there's no PE here. So the model now says, okay, no PE, uh, it's low risk. But let's say that you trained a separate model, that's an imaging model, just to predict off of the CT. And let's say that that model is predicting high risk. What we would say here is that these two models have diverged in their prediction. So one model is predicting high risk, the other is low risk. Um, we think that this could actually be really interesting and, and you can learn a lot from it. And so we're sort of fleshing this idea out now because it means either the imaging model, the CT model is wrong, and this is a, a good sort of edge case where we can uh, train the model to do better, or there's something in the image that is hard for a physician to see, and we really need to be getting a, a second opinion. So in either case, we think there's a lot that can be uh, learned here, and this idea of divergence and, and models trained on different sets of data um, for the same task can be really interesting. So all of that, I think, leads into this, this sort of question of uh, even if we have an accurate model, um, the next step is naturally just to sort of uh, create some clinical decision support, roll it out to physicians, and, and it will help them with their uh, decision making. But I, I think uh, this is actually uh, um, close to, to Columbia. This work was done at Yale, and, and I, I think it's one of the, the more important uh, papers in this area in the last several years because it, it illustrates um, this is not always the case, and we need to be a lot more diligent and careful about uh, the way this works. And so I, I really like to um, and sort of this, this first prediction section uh, by, by showing this to show the importance of the um, implementation side and, and physician-computer interaction side. Um, and so 
in this study, they looked at acute kidney injury and um, acute kidney injury is a, an important outcome. Uh, it's uh, fairly common as far as things go in, in terms of inpatient about 15%. And it has a huge uh, increase in inpatient mortality or it's associated with a huge increase, um, may not be causative. Um, and so um, in this, one of the, the sort of important uh, factors is that, or one of the important things to think about in this paper is that the intervention for AKI initially um, is not some invasive surgery or you're not you're not cutting somebody open you're you're generally ordering a few extra labs and, and doing some closer monitoring of that patient and so you would think that if we wanted to um, arrange a study to, to ask whether clinical decision support for for AKI could be helpful um, there'd be very little chance that it could it could actually cause harm um, you, you would think that it would be pretty benign given the intervention and so um, this, this group out of Yale uh, put together a study where it's a multi-center randomized clinical trial to generate sort of the, the gold standard of evidence where um, they had uh, the national societal guidelines, no predictive model here. They're just looking at the definition for AKI and for um, half of the patients, if they met the definition, you would see this alert. For half the patients, they wouldn't show any alert. And they asked the question of how does that affect patient outcomes? Um, and, and this alert, just to sort of highlight this, you can either do that AKI order set, which were uh, closer fluids monitoring a few labs to, to look at uh, uh, fluid levels, the, or you can add the acute kidney injury as a problem to their uh, to their chart. So you're not, um, again, you're not sort of cutting somebody open. You're not uh, giving them a dangerous medication or, or, or something that um, you're not sort of starting chemotherapy or, or making some uh, decision like that. And so we would think that this could be pretty benign. Um, what they found was that in the non-teaching suburban hospitals that the alert group uh, had a uh, significantly higher and, and sort of um, to the point where this is like the effect size that you would dream about seeing the opposite direction for any clinical decision support project. We sort of rarely see an effect size this big. Um, they unfortunately saw it the opposite where it was increasing um, both death and, and the composite outcome. I sort of focus on, on death here uh, because uh, I think once you see overall survival, uh, you don't care about any other outcome if you're uh, significantly affecting overall survival, especially uh, this substantially. Um, and so the, the point of this is, is really to say, uh, without even a predictive model here, if we are using clinical decision support or any of these tools to uh, try to impact uh, clinical behavior, um, we really need to be careful and we really need to be doing these rigorous, this rigorous evaluation um, and doing randomization and actually uh, generating this level of evidence. Otherwise, uh, I think there are a lot of things that are implemented in health systems around the country that have not been uh, rigorously evaluated to this level um, and, and may actually be causing harm because we just assume something like this would be benign. Um, and we've done uh, a secondary analysis of this that's in review. The uh, authors of the study were nice enough to, to sort of share all of the, the original data and, and just to give uh, our hypothesis. Obviously, um, this is post hoc, we lose randomization. And so we're using causal inference approaches, but sort of I give all of that as a, as a caveat. Um, it basically looks like there's a few different factors. Um, a, the alert in the, in the cases where uh, patients are dying appears to be taking uh, physicians' eye off of some very serious other problem. And so if somebody has uh, late stage heart failure um, and then you tell a, something pops up on their screen telling them to worry about AKI, uh, maybe they're not doing something they should be doing for heart failure. Um, there, there's some other factors too of whether a resident or an attending saw the actual alert and, and, and different effects there. Um, so there's there's a lot still in terms of uh, really understanding what's happening in that trial. But the, the main point is that we should be doing trials like this for uh, most critical decision support that we aim to, to implement. And so uh, finally, I wanted to sort of wrap back to uh, the conversation around um, all the way in the beginning where we had the structured data and epilepsy. Um, and uh, only really saw that the uh, patient was being treated correctly by looking at the notes. We know we couldn't really detect that from just looking at the ICD codes or um, sort of the, the downstream medication prescriptions and things like that. Um, and so we wanted to look at this problem where uh, I've been really interested in it for a while because uh, the question of whether a kid who has a seizure-like event should start an anti-seizure me medication is, is a tough one. Um, where the guidelines actually suggest that we should give an ASM or anti-seizure medication if the the kid has a, a risk of 60% or greater um, and, uh, of having additional seizures. And so it's a challenging sort of cutoff uh, for, for a variety of reasons, but um, 
basically, I think any time that you're giving a uh, drug that can potentially reach the brain um, is, is sort of a, a big decision to be made. Um, we also know that many of the ASMs have uh, relatively severe side effect profiles or not things that we want to give lightly. Um, and, and so they're, they're, they sort of set this threshold of, of try and, and also uh, once you start an ASM, a lot of times it's very hard to, to wean off of it, um, especially uh, as kids start to uh, reach the age where they might be driving and things like that. Um, they're going to want to stay on the ASM so that they can keep their driver's license. And there's all of these, it's a very complex uh, uh, decision process, but um, the, the sort of core question we wanted to ask is how well can physicians actually do at predicting the 60% uh, because it's sort of a, a challenging question. And, and uh, we know humans generally aren't good at putting exact numbers on, on risks. And so an example of this, and, and this is say a, a patient coming in and it's uh, obviously been de-identified and, and, and modified uh, and, and simplified in a lot of ways, but this is an example note from a patient who had their first seizure-like event. And what we saw was that uh, there's a lot of information here that, that might be uh, might help to, to determine um, or might indicate how much uh, physicians actually know about an initial seizure. And this is all in the context of knowing um, an initial seizure might happen in school. And so you, you have a teacher telling a parent, telling a physician about what happened. And so there's this almost game of telephone and, and it can be really hard initially to understand um, whether it was actually a seizure or, or any number of different uh, types of uh, convulsions or other events. And so um, within this, we basically started and said, okay, there's a lot that's actually recorded in the note that may be uh, predictive of whether uh, future seizures occur. So we can start with this and say, what if we try to just predict from the note uh, whether the, 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 the actual uh, uh, pediatric patient will have an additional seizure? And so the study was really set up to, to ask two questions. Uh, one, which we can't get at right away, um, and, and we're sort of now doing additional work to, to, to study this question, um, but we wanted to ask, can physicians predict this likelihood? And then second, do clinical notes capture this intuition? And, and our point really is that um, if we want to be able to predict the likelihood of seizure, we really need to be able to uh, collect the right information to even do that. And so step one was, can we predict from the notes? And what that did was uh, gave us the ability to now run a prospective study where we're actually asking uh, pediatric neurologists in advance whether they think a, a patient will have a recurrent seizure or not. And so it really generated the preliminary evidence to, to sort of do the, the prospective study that otherwise uh, would, would be hard to conduct. And so, um, we really focused on this, the second task in the study that I'll show now, but we're, we're sort of currently uh, working on this, this first task in an ongoing study. And so um, to do this, we, we wanted to look at uh, predominantly notes, but I was at uh, Harvard at the time that, that we sort of started this work and, and um, sort of continued to keep an affiliation there to finish it. Um, and so we were working at, at Boston Children's, which we know is not a typical children's hospital. And so we, we also compared to this, uh, nationwide um, administrative data set. So the IBM market scan data set used to be called Truven. Um, and, and there's no notes there. So that's, uh, I think, an important limitation. We can't do the, sort of the same study in both. But what we wanted to do is to be able to sort of compare the populations and fully acknowledge that the, the Boston Children's uh, population is, is different than um, the IBM market scan data. And so we need to be a little bit careful about asking whether things will generalize or not. And so, what we did uh, in the study was was we took, um, this is uh, sort of before the current craze of large language models, actually, this is uh, when uh, we were barely able to pass in uh, 4,000 tokens at a time. Um, the, the, the original model that we used is called the clinical long former model. Um, so this all of this work was done, I would say uh, like May of 2022. Um, might have, no, I, yeah. Um, so, so before uh, ChatGPT and all of that sort of emerged, but um, we took the notes for patients who didn't meet our inclusion criteria because we, we put in pretty uh, strict inclusion criteria to try to capture um, new onset seizure-like events. Um, and so you had to have care through Boston Children's for other things um, for, for at least two years prior. Um, and then you also had to have an appropriate follow-up period. And so we took all of the patients who didn't meet those criteria and took all of their notes and, and could actually do uh, the pre-training on those. And so um, this is basically the uh, basic um, approach where we take the inpatient notes and we predict the, the seizure likelihood. Um, 
And I paused for a second because this, this work has been accepted as, as impressed now. Um, and so we compared that to initially, so that there's sort of the large language mo model approach. We compared that to using just structured data. Um, and so we did structured data in both uh, Boston Children's and in the IBM market scan data where we could. Um, and so uh, uh, there's some signal here. Um, we're seeing an, an AC over 0.7, um, which is uh, a decent starting point. Um, when we took just the base clinical long former approach, um, importantly, with, with all of the, the layers being trainable, uh, made a, a substantial difference. Um, we, we saw an AC, I think it was about 0 0.85, 0 0.86. Um, but when we actually took our, our fine-tuned and pre-trained model, we're, we're all of a sudden approaching uh, 0.9. And so you saw this sort of steady increase as we uh, were able to account for more data and then also use a model that was uh, domain-specific uh, and, and sort of fine-tuned within uh, a pediatric children's hospital, as opposed to the original clinical long former model, which is a, an adult ICU setting. It was originally trained on MIMIC. The issue here, and, and now the sort of the continued work that, that we're doing is, uh, this model is, is fairly complex. It's really hard to in interpret. Um, so we wanted to, we did a couple of things in that first paper, um, some of which were pushed by reviewers that we don't think really uh, fully solve the question of interpretability, but um, they're, they're at least starting points. And then I'll, I'll talk about sort of what we're doing now to try to, to solve some of these challenges. And so first we looked at how do different note types actually contribute to this? Because you might think, uh, say a uh, discharge summary at the end of the visit and, and all of that at the end of, the, of an admission even would um, have the most information and it would have it all synthesized in a nice way and it might be the best model. Um, you might think that those patients who have an EEG, so say a 48 hour EEG study or uh, have advanced imaging in, in the form of an MRI or CT report, um, that those would be most useful. Um, what we found is that generally the, the domain specific model, so neurology notes and consults, and then including all notes ended up being the best. And, and so some of our hypotheses around this end up being that we think those patients who get some of the advanced imaging are the ones that are harder to uh, classify. So if a patient uh, very clearly had a seizure, we think they have a high risk. There, there, there wouldn't necessarily be a need for this before starting an ASM. Um, or if uh, you get the report and it's very clear that they didn't have a seizure, um, that may be the other case where it's not even worth doing an EEG or, or advanced imaging. And so um, there's sort of the, this combination, but but in the end, including all of the notes and allowing the, the model to determine what's important uh, was was still the strongest performing. Um, the other thing that we did, and this is this is part of what I, I thought was uh, not particularly strong in terms of uh, model interpretability was you can provide sort of various prompts and ask the model to complete. And um, when you look at sort of the top five, uh, what you see in this is that uh, we are, um, able to train a model that is obviously more clearly thinking about uh, seizures. Um, I don't know if this actually tells you that the, the model is, is learning um, beyond the ability to speak the language. And then that's why I thought that uh, this was a, a little bit challenging. And so to solve some of these interpretability problems, but also to make notes more useful in general, um, for example, many, many studies that we run require manual chart review. Um, we know that there are a lot of challenges here. The, to do manual chart review is, is time consuming. It's very hard to get people who are actually qualified to do it. Um, and even when you do, there are oftentimes inconsistencies between different reviewers. Um, and then it just takes a lot of time. Uh, you, even uh, in terms of uh, if you are willing to uh, pay and you have resources and you can even find people to do it, um, you're asking uh, oftentimes physicians who are busy otherwise to, to spend their time doing data generation. So it can just be a, a, a big lag between um, when the data are actually available. And so what we really wanted to ask was, instead of doing this approach where um, we're going straight from an input to an output, where, and you have this very complex model sitting between, could we instead use a large language model and have a very complex step, but instead of going straight to the output, we have a set of intermediate features where we can actually validate that we're extracting the right things. And so an example of this uh, would be, uh, was this patient's seizure focal or generalized? And then you could have that, and, and you could just directly go back to the note and ask which, which of those answers uh, it is. And so we, you can set a, a, create a set of intermediate features that are uh, much simpler than the original input, but are uh, clinically relevant to the condition that you're actually studying. 
And then you can use those for downstream tasks with a much simpler model. Uh, that could even be something like logistic regression or uh, something that is more traditional in, in our ability to understand it. And, and you could do all sorts of downstream tasks with, with those uh, simpler features. And we've done this with, say, uh, 40 features to, to sort of uh, describe particular conditions. And so how do we do this and how do we actually automate this? Um, this is a reference to uh, the original instruction fine tuning paper uh, for large language models where um, what they found was that you can generate labeled rules. So you, you do pre-training on huge amounts of unlabeled data, and then you generate a, a relatively small amount of labeled rules. And this is the, the original uh, paper out of Google where they asked the question, um, answer the following yes or no question, can you write a whole haiku in a single tweet? And the answer is yes. And then they expand upon that with different things around chain of thought and, and uh, exemplars and, and all of that. We asked the question, could we generate these types of instructions using electronic medical records? And so that's that's sort of what we set out to do by using the metadata around clinical notes to create weak labels. So um, we fully acknowledge that what we're saying here are the metadata, so that the structured information in the AMR um, are not perfect. And, and that's why we're saying weak labels. We expect that there's a lot of noise here. And But, but to give an example of what that actually looks like, say you have an, a discharge summary, an example instruction could be what's the age of this patient and the rule is that you actually just look up the patient age from the uh, demographic certain table and so you're training the the model to take in the note and to uh, answer the question of what's the age of the patient um, based off of information in the note another example of this would be something like a, a head ct um, and you'd ask uh, did the patient experience an intracranial hemorrhage and then using a set of uh, icd codes and treatment rules we can um, say that this particular one works with just icd codes um, Intracranial hemorrhage, if it's appearing in a head CT, it's, it's almost always going to generate an, an ICD code. Um, there are a lot of things that are less clear than that, uh, but these are sort of, I think, nice examples. Um, we did this with uh, with Mimic initially, and, and using the different types of note categories, we could generate a, a huge amount of uh, total training instructions. We, we've actually, uh, since the slide was created, worked with, with additional clinicians to create a bunch of uh, new tasks, and I, I think the total is up to, to almost uh, 40 million total training tasks now. Um, where you have uh, these four um, weak supervision for instruction fine tuning. And then we, we could uh, actually evaluate performance and, and see if this works for extracting things. And so examples are, uh, there's an I2B2 uh, cohort selection task. So basically, would this patient be a fit for a clinical trial is basically what this task is asking. Um, and so an example would be, does the patient have a history of inter abdominal surgery or did they have a, an MI in the last six months? Those are the types of things that are included in the, the task. Um, Another one is going back to pediatric epilepsy. Um, we had done a lot of work in trying to extract uh, the results of genetic testing from clinical notes because the way that they had been reported for a very long time was not making it into any structured form in, in the EMR. It was just being reported in a PDF that, that then was being uh, summarized in the note. And so uh, we had done a ton of manual annotation here already, and we just picked uh, 500 notes uh, with 250 where a particular gene was implicated and asked, uh, can we tell if a gene was implicated and then actually specify which gene? And then the last was uh, for patients who have um, recurring seizures and uh, potentially intractable epilepsy where we've tried a bunch of medications, it's not um, leading to any benefit. There are some that are candidates for resective epilepsy surgery. And, and this is asking the question uh, in the follow-up a year later, um, were they actually seizure-free? something that would, again, be captured in, in the notes. And, and with this, what we saw is that this idea, which we're calling uh, um, context-derived weak supervision um, for uh, models, greatly increased their ability to um, extract uh, th these data um, to the point where you have the, the, the base model, which I, I think is uh, something on the order of uh, 40 times or so smaller than the, the XXL model, um, outperforming it um, with, with the uh, instruction fine-tuning. And so um, the other sort of key here is that we're doing this in, in a zero shot approach in the evaluation tasks. And um, we're actually getting uh, very similar performance in the I2BT tasks to the fully supervised challenge that was done as recently as 2018. And so it's just amazing how fast this, this field has actually moved where we now have a uh, zero shot performance uh, essentially on par with, with fully supervised performance. And so we, we have a number of next steps for, for this particular work where we're asking, uh, which rules are most helpful. Um, I, I guess I really want them to be helpful because I'm repeating that. Um, how noisy can a rule actually be to be helpful? Um, 
So we know that oftentimes these labels are wrong and it's weak supervision, but how wrong, how, like how often can they be wrong and still actually help make the model better? And then we're really looking for additional evaluation tasks. And so if there's anybody who knows of any, uh, we'd really love to uh, test generalizability here, but also um, two of our tasks can't be shared uh, publicly. And so if there are any uh, data sets people are aware of or are good tasks for something like this, um, we'd love to have things that uh, we can sort of put our approach out there as a benchmark and then others can come in and sort of uh, come up with better sets of rules or better models and things like that to, to improve on. Um, so we really think it's the uh, set of uh, tasks and um, coming up with ways to create the instructions that are uh, really the, the core contributions here. Um, we expect that somebody will have a better model um, and, and we're even using uh, Plan T5, which is now sort of uh, ancient in the world of large language models um, for this initial example. So to sort of summarize uh, today's talk, I think there's a lot um, that we should be doing to make sure that uh, things that our clinical prediction models um, stand on and, and don't sort of just simply look over, cheat off of uh, clinicians. Um, and so if we really want to get to the point of individualized clinical decision support, we need to be showing that we're actually learning from the patient, not copying the physician. And uh, to sort of even bring this back to that last bit, uh, we would hope to extract a set of key features that are actually describing the patient and things that you then in the future might directly collect about the patient as opposed to just getting from the notes because the notes aren't available right away. Um, as opposed to seeing the way that a patient is writing about a, note, uh, a patient, um, seeing the way a physician is writing about a patient because uh, you you might be able to see how, how concerned they are about the patient about the, by the way that they write about them. Um, we should also be showing that these models outperform uh, models of clinician behavior um, that are things based off of strictly the charges data or other sort of uh, um, healthcare dynamics and things like that. Um, then we need to show that the model output uh, to the clinician changes what they would have done. Um, and finally, we need to show that these changes in behavior actually improve patient outcomes. And so with that, I'd like to thank uh, many contributors. I think I'm probably missing uh, many from the slide now that, that need to be added. Um, and, and thank you all for, for coming. I'd be happy to, to answer any questions or to, to have any discussions. And I, I guess I should add one more bit of, uh, I'm, I'm very actively recruiting uh, postdocs and, and data scientists. And if anybody uh, is interested in, in studying any of these problems, would love to chat. Thank you so much. Um, I'm gonna let people, give people a minute. If you wanna throw your hand up, we can call you on the Zoom. I see we have a question from Cindy already. Cindy, you want to take it away? Yeah, thanks for this talk. It was so interesting. Um, I guess one question I have is how come you guys chose to use, I guess it's the task, but is there any benefit to like just using like, like raw EEGs, for example, versus EEG notes? Because I know even like the EEG readers, like sometimes there's like no expert consensus. Yes, um, great question, huge problem. Um, oftentimes EEGs are 48 hours. Most of the methods to uh, actually analyze those right now focus on very narrow windows. Um, so it's, it's something that uh, I actually have a student um, who might even be on the call right now um, who is actively working on that problem of going straight to the EEGs. Um, one of the problems with that though is we need to do that for EEGs, we need to do that for MRIs, we need to do that for CT scans. Then uh, Boston Children's has used multiple EEG platforms during this time period. And so they have multiple different pre-processing and transformations that you need to deal with. And so right now we're essentially cheating and just using the report. Um, I would love to get to that. Uh, and, and that's part of actually what I pitched when I was moving to, to Chicago is that it becomes more multimodal and we start to, to use that. But we've already done some work here, um, particularly for uh, neonatal EEGs. And, and there's a problem because most of the, the EEGs are come with software built in and algorithms built in to detect areas of interest. Where, so say when a seizure is occurring, um, what we saw is that these are really bad for neonates. They do a really bad job of, of doing that. And so um, those are, are the, the point of this detection is to highlight an area for a physician to actually look at and to decide like, what are the hotspots or the areas that I need to go back and, and sort of pay attention to. Um, and the issue is if you're not, catching those, then they're not looking at the right spots. And it, it's it's a challenging problem because oftentimes you're doing 48 hour or longer EEGs. You can't have a physician watching that constantly. And this is the type of thing that you would expect that 
computers and machine learning would be better at, but we haven't generated enough, uh, I think, really good data yet to do that. And especially when you look at uh, neonates, uh, they're, I mean, we assembled, uh, there's a group in Sweden that, that published some data, and then we, we've assembled, uh, assembled a cohort that is like the, the largest with this much data, and I think it's like 79 patients. Um, so it's it, there's, there's a long way to go. So, so basically, to answer your question, uh, I don't have a good reason for not doing it yet, other than it's hard, and uh, we want to go in that direction. Yeah. <laughs> and Dina? Yeah, hi. Thank you so much for your talk. It was super interesting. Um, I have kind of two questions. Um, I was wondering for the uh, prediction of this seizure, seizure um, like 60% risk, I was wondering how you handle it when a patient is put on an anti-seizure medication, because I would assume that that would mean that the physician thought that there was 60% risk, but hopefully that would mean that the risk of future seizure is lower. Yeah, um, the composite rules for that, there's a reason I actually didn't present it here because it could probably be the whole presentation of just like, how do you, because that's that's a, a challenge in studying epilepsy is that uh, seizures are not recorded in the EMR. Um, you might have a note that says this patient has experienced seizures or you might have some uh, variants of how many seizures, but our, our labeling is right now currently based off of only structured data for that, that composite rule. And it was done with a, a variety of uh, Epileptologist, particularly uh, Mauricio and, and Paige here, um, help, helped out quite a bit with that. And then they also brought in a, a number of other people. And so um, actually Ben helped with that too. But um, that is something that uh, is definitely not perfect. And we had to use a variety of like, not just one ASM, but did they get multiple ASMs? Did they stay on that? Um, because that is either saying uh, they're pretty confident that they're um, recurring, uh, you know, they're, they're it's a uh, endpoint that unfortunately is not currently available. And so that's where like the second stage, th this was all this uh, set the stage for how do we get enough data to then get physicians to spend the time up front to answer a quick survey of what do you think the risk is for this patient? And then actually answer the question of did they have additional seizures or not? Um, there is still, that still doesn't answer the question of if they say the patient is high risk, then they start an ASM and then they don't have any more seizures, what do you do with that group? And so we're still uh, sort of fleshing that out. And so if you have ideas, I, I'd love to, to chat about sort of uh, that in-between category. But I mean, I think that's a uh, classical challenge in, in biomedical informatics is that we don't have counterfactuals. Um, it's, it's it's maybe our, our biggest challenge and without randomization, you can't really uh, do anything about it. And so um, maybe there is some randomized study here where you're, you're actually looking at uh, that risk to ask whether that 60% is even right, but then you need to deal with the whole question of clinical equipoise. And, and, and so there's, uh, again, I think a, a, a fairly uh, complex question actually. Yeah, no, thank you. That was, yeah, yeah I, uh, I appreciate that. <laughs> my, uh, yeah. my second question has kind of to do with like how quickly the field is moving. Um, so like in your talk, you talked about how we should, like, it would be best for us to do clinical trials for our clinical decision support tools to like rigorously evaluate that we're not doing harm. Um, but you've also discussed how quickly the field is moving. Uh, I'm wondering like how you see that, uh, how you see that working out when you want to validate a tool, but then by the end of the clinical trial, like that might be outdated technology. Yeah, at least in the, the context of clinical decision support, um, I, I would say that a lot of this is uh, platform build as opposed to uh, what we've done so far is that we require a lot of work for each individual study, um, when in reality, those should be very incremental. And there, there are a few groups that have started to do this really well. Um, I know uh, NYU, local ADU, um, Leora, Hor Leora Horowitz's group there has built out a ability to rapidly run randomized trials. Um, I think they did that with like 300,000 people and there were only $300,000 and there were only five people involved in the project and they weren't, none of them were full-time. Um, so showing that like that you can build that, that initial platform. We actually just got a grant from the, the Moore Foundation to do this at, at UChicago um, or something similar where again, it's all about how do you build because every technology company in the world has, has A-B testing. Um, how do you build something out so that somebody who's a qualified PI can make their way through the regulatory process, particularly when you're asking about two different competing standards of care 
or you have something like the AKI example where um, it's a uh, best practice. Um, and so there's not the need for active enrollment because you're comparing, I mean, what you're doing is you're putting in a clinical decision support alert to try to get people to, to follow the best practice. Um, so there, there are many, many things that we can do uh, fairly rapidly if that infrastructure is built and in place. Um, I think the challenge right now is that uh, very few places have that infrastructure in place. And it's, uh, I think in some ways we've become overly reliant on some of the EMRs and they shouldn't be the ones to build this because especially when they offer their own models, if you want to be able to measure if their model is helping, you should be using their tool to measure it. Um, and so uh, definitely uh, both an, an academic and sort of entrepreneurial interest for, for me right now is how do you solve uh, exactly that problem? It still doesn't solve the case where uh, you do need active enrollment of, of patients, but I think you can still expedite that part too if it's a new device or um, you're, you're trying to actually put in some new intervention beyond clinical decision support. Thank you. George? All right, thanks. For the sorry, I was just gonna say, I think uh, Duke has done a lot of work in that area too, if you're if you're looking. Uh, and then I think there's a recent paper out of Stanford, it was uh, Jonathan Chen and Nigam Shah um, had on, on that space as well, um, that I can um, forward you if you if you email me or something, um, if, if you're interested in that, yeah. It's definitely, a, a, I think, a, a very actively evolving area. Yeah, thank you, I will email you. <laughs> Okay, so I was hoping to follow up on the point on your last slide about trying to demonstrate that the models can outperform clinicians in a lot of practical settings. So I was wondering a few points. So one is that it seems like it is common for people to expect machine learning models to always do better than humans. Do you think there are some cases where the real world data that has some biases driven by clinicians and potentially incorrect decisions can at least decrease the perceived performance of models. And then I was also wondering if you do put out a model in the real world and say it does better than clinicians, do you anticipate that some clinicians might be a little less willing to use it since they might not want to actually believe this model that is in some ways uninterpretable can do better than their own expertise? So I guess that's two questions. Yeah, so I, th I think to the, the first one, um, sometimes we set ourselves up for uh, almost impossible to achieve goals that stop progress. Um, you know, it's the, the classic example of like, we can't have driverless cars unless nobody ever dies. Um, even if we greatly reduce the risk, uh, every single person, not every single person, many people still think that they are the outlier who is a far better driver than average and therefore it doesn't reduce the risk for them. So there, there's uh, definitely that sort of uh, psychological factor that uh, I think we should, we should fully acknowledge. Um, to the second point, I, I was checking, um, I dropped the appendix for, for size because I had to send uh, a, a set of these slides to somebody. But um, in my appendix, I had a, a set of, uh, a list of all of the medications that we don't understand how they work. Um, so, so even one as simple as, I'll, I'll go with like lithium for bipolar. Um, there have been a number of papers in the last uh, 10 years, uh, despite the fact that it's been used since the 40s, um, that have been really trying to understand exactly how it works. And so my argument would sort of be, uh, Biology is complicated. Um, you have, for example, a single pathway can have many different components. Then the healthcare process that actually generates the data is very complicated. And therefore, like, is it realistic to expect that we have a very simple interpretable model that can capture all of this complicated, uh, uh, essentially these complex interactions? Um, and so that's again, where I sort of point at, if we did more rigorous evaluation, and did the randomized trials, it, 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 that becomes more like the medications where um, you don't have to fully understand every aspect about how it works all the time. You have to know that it does work and that it does work in this population and it works well. Um, and that again, sort of goes to, to, to my take on some of the uh, platform for enabling randomization is that if you have that in place and you can run one study, then all of a sudden you can run others and see if they're working in different demographic groups and things like that and really be testing all of these so that you don't have to rely on um, a person understanding exactly how a model works too. Um, so I think uh, it doesn't sort of uh, maybe directly answer your question, but I, I think these are not necessarily questions that are fully unique to healthcare either. You know, it's sort of a, there's this uh, human psyche question around uh, 
what is actually uh, realistic and what is actually what what actually represents improvement as opposed to um, what is perfect. Um, and I think what we should be looking for, I mean, we call it quality improvement for a reason. It's not sort of a like quality perfection or something like that. It's, it's we're we're working towards uh, improving upon the current standard, and that's what we should be measuring against. And um, that being said, I think uh, in a lot of areas, particularly where there's a lot of money to be made, there's a lot of effort to try to uh, belittle or, or uh, reduce the current standard uh, performance. And there's a lot of strategic cohort selection. So we have to be careful of that as well. But um, I think just comparing to uh, what is the current standard of practice is, 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 is our best bet. And then doing these rigorous studies to show that you're getting benefit. And that's how you get adoption as opposed to uh, trying to sit somebody through and, and walk them through a model. I mean, we've we've already sort of uh, shot ourselves in the foot on that in terms of uh, all of the decision trees that have been presented to physicians that say, um, if patient has less than 0. 0.00073, but more than, uh, you know, like there's crazy splits and things like that, that um, a lot of the interpretability isn't, isn't trusted anyways. Still think it's worth doing because it can help us to understand the models. I just don't think it's the, it necessarily needs to be the selling point to uh, a clinician to actually use a model. So I guess as a follow-up, do you think potentially some customers that is the clinician has been practicing for 40 years and trust their own intuition experience and experience isn't necessarily as relevant a customer as some of the people who are just let's say executives of industry companies who want to improve efficiencies in some ways, or do you still view clinicians as the main customers for all these products? Um, I solely focus on um, the physician or set of physicians that want to uh, run the study initially, because uh, without that, it, I mean, you can try top down and it's, uh, that's how you end up with them just ignoring it. You know, like the, every other, uh, how how many epic alerts do, do people have to click through to get anything done right now? Uh, and that's another area of like, why aren't we running lots of randomized studies to show that we can get rid of alerts um, without decreasing care? Um, like those are the types of things where if we are giving that back to uh, the clinical community, maybe they will appreciate us more because we're reducing some of the burden too. You know, like uh, it, right now it, it feels like it's uh, too focused on um, solely adding uh, as opposed to uh, how, how do we sort of uh, reduce workflow. So I, I've always focused on that. And that's why I think like this, this idea of having um, a platform that lets you uh, easily run these studies where not everyone has to be a one-off. Um, the, the whole idea there is to sort of uh, democratize the ability to run these studies where a qualified uh, physician PI can get uh, four other physicians and say, uh, Let's anytime somebody meets criteria to be in this this study for the four of us or five of us, uh, it, it'll actually randomize and, and do that. Um, and then if you do it in that way too, you can get the gold standard uh, labeled data at the end too, because if it's their study that they're going to publish, they'll be okay entering that one extra data point of uh, did the patient have a complication from surgery or not. Um, and, and, and so uh, I think that's the only way to go forward because otherwise we end up with the same messy endpoint data that we've had for a long time. And so unless you're, you're really partnering with them. Um, I mean, one one last example, I, I've worked a, a bunch in postpartum hemorrhage. Um, and one of the things that you'll see is if you look at estimated blood loss, um, and I won't say what health systems that I'm doing this in other than it, it hasn't been at Chicago, it hasn't been at uh, any of the Harvard systems, um, but others uh, that, that we've worked with, um, and it, it's double digits, you see a huge increase of uh, postpartum hemorrhage or estimated blood loss around uh, between 900 and, 900 and 999, um, where a thousand milliliters is sort of the cutoff for defining postpartum hemorrhage. Um, the issue is postpartum hemorrhage is a, a quality metric um, and uh, obstetrics and, and then sort of uh, neonatal care and all of that is one of the few places that uh, patients, but in this case, essentially are essentially consumers. Um, and they can choose what health system to uh, go to for their obstetrics care, and they can uh, plan to have their delivery at a particular health system. And so um, if you used endpoints that are uh, able to be gamed or, or are biased for various different reasons, uh, I don't think you get that the same benefit. And so um, I, I don't know that going top down will ever work. 
All right. So I think we're just about at time. Um, but if you're willing to stay on Dr. Grail or Jones, I'll I'll let others stay on and ask more questions if they have them. Um, if not, I'm happy to share your email with them if that's all right with you. Yeah, um, definitely. And maybe they can find you online and have more extended conversations. But thank you so, so much definitely. once again for coming. This was a great talk and awesome discussion around this. And so, so excited to see sort of this first taste of this and see where this goes next. Yeah, awesome. Well, th thank you all for coming. And I appreciate the questions. They've all been... Uh... I think you can tell from the long-winded answers, they're not the easiest things to, to, to give yes or no answers to. So I appreciate them. No, this is great. We love this discussion. So thank you so much. And thank you all. Have a good one. Take care. Thanks. Thanks.